Okay, we can start now. It's an honor to welcome and it's an honor to have here Professor Xi Jin, an old friend. He was for many years in the United States, but now she came back to China, Shanghai, in Shanghai University. And also is the director of the Institute of Natural Science. I don't know in what town, but anyway. Shanghai, what Shanghai? So even no, but in another town, you have another appointment. Ah, oh, that's something, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, uh, so he was active uh, for uh, numerical schemes, for uh, hyperbolic equation, uh, kinetic equation, and so on. And now he's devoting his uh, research uh, on uh, quantum computing and applied to partial differential equation. is uh, new for me, at least. So uh, it's a pleasure to listen to uh, your talk. And uh, you have a uh, 45, 50 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Robert, for uh, arranging this uh, seminar. It's a very great pleasure for me. Uh, I haven't seen, uh, I met some of you last year, but I haven't seen Robert for many years. I love a lot of so it's very great to, to be here. Uh, all right, so today I'm going to uh, share with you uh, my latest uh, research fantasy. I've been working very hard in this subject uh, for the last two years, uh, especially during the pandemic. Um, so the quantum computation uh, for P P partial differential equations. So this is basically what I want to talk about. Well, excuse me if you already know the subject, but just in case, uh, I want to give a very short presentation of uh, what I call a mathematician survival kits for quantum computing, the very basic concepts about quantum computing. Then I will uh, talk about our works in linear PDs or nonlinear PDs, and then uh, sort of non autonomous differential equations. And in the end, if I have time, I talk about how they handle PDs with random coefficients in, in the subject of so called uncertainty quantification. So, first of course, why we want quantum computers? So if you, if you have been working on computational physics, then you know that the most challenging problem is to solve a Schrodinger equation, unbody Schrodinger equation, which is here. Uh, it's, a, it's a linear PDE. I mean, look, mathematics theory looks simple, but uh, the problem is that usually you have uh, lots of uh, electrons, nuclei. So it's, PDEs are usually several hundred dimensions. It's really the size of the PDE that cannot be solved. By classical computers, right? So this gentleman, Richard Feynman, uh, 40 years ago, he said, "Well, this is it's mission impossible for classical computers to solve this equation, right?" So he then he said, uh, "Maybe we should have a new type of uh, computers that's built of by quantum mechanics principle, right? Built on uh, it's a the computer device itself is a quantum mechanics system. So basically, he, he said, oh, well, let's use just quantum system to simulate other quantum systems." And he also uh, imagined how one can build such a computer uh, using the idea from the electron spins, spin up and down, <coughs> corresponding to now what uh, you probably heard about, so the quantum qubits, the quantum bits. Uh, well, what classical computer we all know, are basically represent any signals by this zero one uh, string of zero ones. Then you do some computation, you output strings of zero ones. Signals, but the quantum computer actually you you compute on quantum state. I will explain what quantum state is. Then the basic operation called quantum gates uh, needs to be unitary matrix or unitary operator. All right, so it's basically from quantum state you multiply by unitary operator, and because unitary operator preserve the, the, the length of a vector, you end up at the quantum state. All right, so it's quantum state multiplied by unitary matrix, and, and that, that's quantum computing. Okay, of course, this quantum state is not a classical data, and to extract the classical data, you have to do so called quantum measurement to get the data. That's usually very expensive. All right, that's uh, called decoding, very expensive because uh, quantum state is a, it's a probabilities, so you have to, it's, then you have to do sort of a lot, a lot of samples. Like Monte Carlo, which is classical, very expensive. So these are our software bits, right? So here is just the, the basic uh, unit vectors in two dimension. So this is Dirac notation, zero cap uh, and one cap is just basic unit vectors in two dimension. A quantum bit, a qubit, is just a linear combination of these two bases. 
But here is linear combination in complex plane. All right, so you have normalized it. So it means that you are talking about uh, all the points on the sphere, in the sphere. So quantum computer basically computes all this information at the same time. That's why it's uh, computed a lot of information at the same time. But that's only one qubit. If you have n qubit, if you have d dimensional problem, I mean, you can use n qubits, then n is basically log d. Okay, so if you have a dimension is 2 to the power n, and you only need n qubit, that's why quantum computer can offer up to exponential speed up because it's log, I mean, this log relation, all right? So that's uh, how you uh, go to and bits, all right. And this, the more uh, there's also another uh, direction called uh, instead of here, the, uh, everything's a vector. But if you use continuous variable, and then you can also design quantum computer using so called uh, quantum modes, Q modes. If you, I mean, just make this uh, vector continuous. And as I said, this quantum gaze are just the unitary matrices. All right, you only can only multiply a vector by unit matrices. And to design a quantum circuit, you do not need to use many unit matrices. Actually, you only need to use these four. Okay, uh, be because there's a, a Solovey uh, Kirchhoff theorem, which says the following: Give me any unit matrix, they can approximate it by a composition of these these four matrices to any position. Okay, so given any epsilon, there exists a composition of these four simple matrices such that you can approximate the original unit matrix with error smaller than epsilon. So these four matrices are called universal quantum gates. You just design quantum circuit using these four, four gates. So two, three of them are just two by two unit matrices. So Harma gate, phase gate, and the T gate. And you also need this this four by four matrix, so called a control knot gate. All right, this control knot is four by four, and the first two by two is just identity, and then this last two uh, you just switch the third and fourth components. So, for example, if you uh, you have two two qubits, and you basically do a tensor product of the zero and the one, you have these four basis vectors, right? Then you apply this control knot to this. This basis, then the first two will remain unchanged because you have two by two identity matrix, right? But the third and fourth one you just uh, swap. So that's one quantum uh, uh, operation, right? So you modify this vector by that matrix. That's one quantum operation. And usually you you, you draw a diagram for for the algorithm. For example, you start with some quantum state, the unit unit vector in complex plane. In modify by unit matrix, you end up with this. All right, so matrix times vector. So these are some examples where x here, x and z are these poly matrices. These poly matrices. And the control knot, the diagram is like this. Control knot is four by four matrix. So you, you apply to a two qubits, so four by four vectors. So if the first uh, signal is zero, then you, it does not change. If it's one, you add to b. And the summation is uh, mode two sub, uh, summation because it's two equals zero. And this is a diagram, the quantum circuit for so called quantum phase estimation. It's a way to compute the largest eigenvalue. If you know linear algebra, to get the largest eigenvalue of A, you just multiply A to a vector many times. In the end, uh, the largest eigenvalue of a vector will remain. Okay, it's a power called power method. So this basically does that. So you have n qubits. The first n minus one, you apply this Hadama, this Hadama uh, gate. The last one, you keep it modified by the same u many times. Uh, uh, one of the important uh, algorithms, so called a uh, fast Fourier transform, and we know that for, uh, Fourier transform is if you have n, n, n nodes, it's n square complexity, but you use fast Fourier transform, it becomes n log n, right? But if you use quantum, this is quantum, uh, that's the uh, quantum circuit for quantum Fourier transform. Then complexity is log n, basically log n squared. So you see that there's exponential speed up. Okay, you just log over whatever, or the classical cost, you take a log. That's why it can be very, very powerful. 
Uh, as I said, a quantum a computer just compute give you a quantum state, and then if you want, so that's more like subroutine, right? A subroutine. If you if you want to get classical data, you want to take a measurement. It's like this, or what we know, this short cats with certain probability the cat is alive, or it can be dead. You don't know, and then you open it to see whether it's zero or one. That's the measurement. But you have to do this a lot of times because you measure the probability of certain outcome in a computational basis. So it can be a cost, it can be very expensive. <coughs> okay, so what, I mean, there are a lot of uh, progress uh, in so-called quantum information theory. People use quantum computers to uh, do coding and uh, yeah, security and so on. But we, we are in, in, uh, doing scientific computing using quantum computing. Uh, so in certain company, of course, the basic problem is to solve a linear, linear algebra system. So if you solve this equation mx equals y. So if m, uh, so the, the first milestone in uh, what we call quantum scientific computing is this algorithm is called a HHL algorithm. Okay. And there's some later improvement. So basically, you, the, the classical problem solving this, if m is a two to the power by two power matrix, complexity is just the size of matrix cubed. If you do Gaussian elimination, for example, that's the cost. Or a quantum computer uh, does this. The quantum, what, what is called quantum linear algebra solver, uh, uh, that you divided by, by these people, is basically you have to give a uh, quantum state on the right-hand side, and then you want to find the quantum state of X, right? So basically you, you, you solve this problem. And with these algorithms and the cost is just a lot of two to the power. That's why it gets so called exponential speed. Right. So not talking about n squared to n log n or the n. I mean n squared becomes log n squared. And the complexity actually depends on the maximum norm of the matrix. And maximum norm is basically the largest entry in absolute value, of course. Not, okay. That's the maximum norm. Kappa is the condition number. So it's basically large eigenvalue divided by the smallest eigenvalue. And S is the sparsity. It means the number of non-zero entries in the row and the column. All right. So that's that's the complexity uh, of this, these algorithms. So what, what we are interested actually is to use a quantum computer to solve uh, differential equations, ODs and PDs, linear ones, nonlinear ones. We're also interested in solving them uh, with many different initial data because there are a lot of problems, for example, in Monte Carlo. You know, generate different initial data, different samples, you solve PDs, in the end, you take on some average. You take, solve the PDs many times, you take on some average. So these are the problems we, we try to hope quantum computing can solve. Uh, however, the quantum computer is designed using a quantum mechanics principle. So basically, it can only know how to solve one type of equation, which is the Schrodinger equation, right? So this is Schrodinger equation, and U is the complex uh, wave function, but this H is sort of Hamiltonian, right? It has two parts. The first part is the kinetic energy, and the V is the potential energy. Right? So that's Hamiltonian, and this H is Hermitian, okay? It's Hermitian, H is Hermitian. So the solution of this equation is just U of T, or uh, uh, is E to the minus I H T act on U zero, all right? Because H is Hermitian, E to the minus I H is unitary image, it's unitary, okay? <coughs> so the so evolution of the shortage equation, you start with quantum state, you evolve by unitary operator, unitary matrix, of course, because this unitary matrix preserve the L2 norm, so you end up uh, Quantum state. So basically, it's just like a, a quantum mechanics experiment. So this is a channel, quantum channel, which corresponding to a Hamiltonian. Then you inject, for example, a laser. Then you collect at the end. That's a, that's a, that's the solution. So that's what quantum computer does. It only knows how to do this. Okay, unit vector, complex unit vector, multiple unit matrix. That's it. You cannot. I mean, any other things you take for granted, quantum computer cannot manage. So I, 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 I always say quantum computer is like infant. You can only drink uh, milk mothers or formula. And if you give him a spaghetti <laughs> or pizza, he, he cannot do it, cannot eat it, all right? 
So what you can do is have to make change visa to a, to, a, to a formula, a milk formula. So for example, here, I mean, uh, let's cover general PD, okay, how to solve other PDs. So here I give example, for example, we have a heat equation, and how is the Laplacian plus some source term, right? So if you, of course, you put it like this, put I, multiply by I, like I, I, L, you call it A, then in general, A is not Hermitian. Okay. A is not Hermitian. So actually, I mean, it's a dissipative, right? There's a dissipative and time universal, but Schrodinger is uh, Hamiltonian, it's conserved energy, that's not dissipate energy. And it's time reversible. Okay. So I cannot do it. Uh, this is like pizza, I mean, or spaghetti. Doesn't work. So these are the questions which I'd answer. I mean, the question is whether, well, the process of solving short equation we call it quantum simulation. Okay. So can you do quantum simulation for other PDs, for other problems? You don't have a quantum meter that only solves one equation, or you want to solve other equations. So the question is how can you can you do quantum simulation for other PDs, ODEs? And the last problem is that short equation is actually is linear. Okay, it's a linear PDE. So how about nonlinear PDs and ODEs? That's what I mean. There are a lot of experts here in nonlinear PDs. And then also this time dependent coefficients and uh, I mean with uncertainty and so on. So those are uh, what, what we are interested in. The first question, how do you solve other PDE? I think we find a very nice uh, universal solution to this. Namely, well, somehow we, we can shorten rise all, all differential equations, okay? We, can, we find a transformation which can transform any linear PDOD into a short equation, believe it or not. So it's joint work with Nana Liu, who is an excellent uh, quantum physicist, actually. She's uh, got her PhD from Oxford. She's a, really a young colleague of mine. She's actually going to visit her alone tomorrow, give a talk tomorrow. You, yes, our poster. So let me give you an example of a heat equation. This is a, just everybody knows this equation, all right? So suppose the suppose one solve it in very high dimension. So this is our transformation, very simple. So you introduce a W, which is U, which only depends on space and time, you multiply by E to the minus P. Now W, of course, you add one dimension. P is the scalar, a positive, okay? So you go to one dimension higher. Well, that is just a very trivial, a trivial calculus. Okay, so you multiply this equation by E to the minus P, W, of course, solves the exact same equation, right? W solves exact same. However, notice that E W dP equals minus W. Okay, because you have E to the minus. DW dP. So I'm going to replace W here behind the function by minus D W dP. Then I get this equation. I have the actual D P D there. So I get the third order P D E for W. And I assume P is positive. And of course, suppose you, solve, you can solve this equation, then how to get back to you? You just integrate. Or you take like take moments from zero to infinity. Mm -hmm. E to the minus P from zero to infinity is one. You can get back to you. Or you can even do simply just multiply E to P to W. Okay. Well, the first question, of course, whether this is a good PD. Now a new PD for W is, is that good PD. And it's, now it's very easy to check that. Now I take a Fourier transform on X. Okay, you take Fourier transform. You have Laplacian. It's not exactly like Laplacian, but it's not Laplacian. Okay, Laplacian, you get a minus the first square for the second for the Now it's actually a linear transformation, right? The way you have to move from the right to left. And remember, I'm solving actually half space problem. So you're solving the P from the other infinity. The way you want to write it is only the one condition that P will be able to. You only want to get the infinity. But because of the time you solve the equation, P is just from the other domain of some large P, or some zero points. That's the problem we're solving. So what's the relation with Schrodinger? Now I, I try to think I a space of C. And for you, I can say, 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 I can I can say, 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 I can 
So we just decompose A into uh, H1 plus IH2, where H1 is the A plus A dagger over 2, and H2 is A minus A dagger over 2i. So, all right, so any, any uh, matrix of vector, can, I mean, uh, operator can be written is basically a Hermitian part and anti Hermitian part. H1 and H2 are both Hermitian, right? Now, IH2 is already. I like, right? You have I times Hermitian matrix. Okay, E to the I H2 is the unitary. But this part is not. Okay. And for this part, I'm going to multiply by E to the minus P. I do that trick. Okay. And then that part, what the second part is the I H2. The first part I change, of course, V to be minus derivative. Okay, because derivative of E to the P is minus. So now you see that the first part has this p derivative in v. Now I take for a transfer on p, then I get i. I need this i. I need i times Hermitian. Okay. Now this part is also the part I like. So essential, of course, uh, in numerical computation, you take a discrete Fourier transform. So assume that these are the discrete Fourier modes. Okay. So basically, you have to design quantum algorithm based on solving this equation. So you have i, i times h1, i times h2, it tends with this diagonal matrix. This diagonal matrix is just a discrete Fourier modes. If you do discrete Fourier. And the second part, you tensor with identity because you do nothing. Okay, so now this is basically what we call a short generalized equation. It's dw equals i times Hermitian matrix, uh, uh, Hermitian matrix times w. That's a short type equation, which quantum computer can solve. And this works for general dynamics. Okay. So of course now I can use apply this. This is universal. It works for any linear equation. You can just find uh, all these li famous linear equations. And to Mario's question, your bound condition, not just periodic bound condition. Periodic is rather easy. Hard bound conditions. 
The bond units are not a unitary operation operators. Okay. What we can do is that you, you discretize it, then the boundary condition becomes part of the inhomogeneous term in dynamic system. Okay. You can still write the boundary condition becomes inhomogeneous in the dynamic system. But inhomogeneous part actually, actually it's the same story with linear algebra. Okay. If you have linear algebra iterative method, it can always be written like this. So you get a new, a new a new solution by modifying the previous iteration by G plus some inhomogeneous term. So the boundary condition actually, not only boundary condition, also interface condition. If you have wave transmission reflection, actually, if you discretize it, then uh, the boundary condition appears as uh, this inhomogeneous term. Now for the inhomogeneous term, you just add another variable. So here's y equal x to be y, k, and y. If you call this one, then you have call this to be uh, this kind to be a new uh, component. Okay. Then that that's a constant corresponding to k. You get you just add one more equation, you make it homogeneous. All right. Now for this this iteration, you just uh, subtract x k. You view x k minus one uh, plus one minus a as d dx dt. You continue rise this uh, discrete direct system, and then you have a, a continuous uh, this O D E linear O D E you can show in the right. So therefore, this uh, iterative solver for linear algebra, you can also apply this, uh, this idea. Okay. Does that answer your question? Just inter include this inhomogeneous term if you discretize uh, any boundary condition. And so, uh, well, I'll probably skip this because I mean, you are mathematicians, you, you, you have physics, I will talk about how do you make this quantum <laughs> computing. And actually this, with this actually, uh, People always ask when you have a quantum computer, right? And the quantum computer are based on if you're using these quantum qubits. And now for IBM just announced they have like 1,000 qubits. But these qubits are very noisy. Now the reason we the quantum computer cannot be used this today is because these qubits are very noisy if there's uh, temperature vibrations or the environment or interaction bacterial waves. It the, the air is too large. You need lots of, you need millions of electrons. I know you may, may have to wait decades before the general purpose quantum become available for uh, general application. But our method actually allows us to go a different route, produce sort of an analog quantum computer. Uh, the young people probably don't know this, but if you were born uh, before 70s, I mean, actually for class computer before 70s, and in some cases, I mean, our digital computer becomes dominant. But before that, even in classical computer, there's analog computer. People use analog computer. But you mean the computer that solve one kind of problem. All right, one computer solve one kind of problem. It's not for uh, a general purpose. So actually, uh, so we, now we are pushing uh, this uh, so-called analog quantum computer, which is based on continuous variable. You do not have to discretize. Because once you discretize, it becomes linear algebra. I have to use qubit, qubit which uh, is too noisy. But this continuous variable formulation, because we, are, we have this continuous map from PD to PD, everything's continuous. And actually, we're working with experimental teams, which where they can design the experiment. And if they can succeed it, then we can make a quantum chip and solve a special purpose quantum computer, which can be designed to solve one kind of PDs. So that's what we're pushing. With this formulation, that becomes possible. And here we do not use qubits, we use these Q modes. Remember, we, we, we talk about Q modes, use continuous variable formulation, that's uh, this direction. So, this is something we are pushing for, actually. I mean, we are the first in the world to do this for PDEs. Uh, some old story about that. I mean, even classical analog computers you, you begin to reemerge after this MIT news, which says analog computer returns, even for class computer. Because now, this, you, you probably know better. With AI, you, you buy a lot of GPUs, it costs a lot of energy. Right? You have big electric vehicle. So there's a new direction, even for class computer design, and not computer which is energy efficient. You maybe have just one computer just solve an abstract equation. You do not need a lot of uh, GPUs from uh, NVIDIA. So there, there's new new trend. Uh, for example, in the US, there's Columbia, uh, Cornell groups, they're uh, doing this uh, so-called energy efficient. PD solvers. Okay. So, uh, 
So, but, but we try to do the quantum version of this analog mode. So that's what we, we think is more near term. We, we hope maybe within 10 years, this, this is possible. By the cubic approach, maybe take 20 or 30 years, you, you don't know. So this is actually what we do. So give me a PDE, we surrenderize it. Okay, we have this Hamiltonian. Then we quantize the Hamiltonian by use, I mean, this is how you go from classical to quantum. You make this X position into a position uh, vector, uh, operator. I make EDX to be I minus I times uh, momentum operator. Then we have this quantum Hamiltonian. We give it to the physicist and they design a, a, a experiment. Once they can simulate this Hamiltonian, Essentially, they have a quantum computer for this equation, for this PD. That's what, what we call the analog quantum computer. So for example, so this is what we special purpose quantum computer. So for example, Maxwell equation. We can shorten rise Maxwell equation, so it can be written like this. And this is our Hamiltonian. See, the sigmas are just Pauli matrices. So we just give a experiment. If you have a sophisticated experiment team, you can design this. Then you have a quantum computer to solve Maxwell equation. It's a very big, important company in China, and they want to collaborate with us on this. <clears throat> so we have, I mean, essentially what we have, we, we call a Expedia, I mean, uh, for linear PDEs. So for any all these PDEs, we shortenerize it, we, we find the corresponding quantum Hamiltonian. So we're seeking a physics experiment in the world. They might be, they have, might have a device which can solve one of these equations. If the, the, the quantum the Hamiltonian corresponding to one of uh, this Hamiltonian we give, then essentially they have quantum computer to solve specific kind of PDs. So that's something. Well, currently actually we are working with five experimental teams in China to try to realize some of these equations. And these are very top uh, experimental lists in China. Well, China is actually leading with US, they are leading the, quantum, the, the industry of quantum computing. So there are a lot of good teams in China They're doing quantum, quantum uh, experiment. All right, uh, so that's the story uh, about linear equations. All right, so we can do essentially linear ODPD, linear algebra. So how about nonlinear equations? Of course, I don't have to tell you how important applications of nonlinear PD is. There are a lot of experts here. <laughs> Mm, and most of the problems are nonlinear. Full dynamics, molecular dynamics, the finance, and even machine learning, is, uh, everything is nonlinear. So the what difficult with nonlinear is not only it's nonlinearity, but also the solutions may be bad, right? You may have shock waves, uh, blow up, or whatever, all this. Uh, what we have. And also, very often you have to solve, if you do, for example, uncertain quantum equation, if you solve a random or stochastic different equation, you have solved PD many times to Monte Carlo. Right, you have long million times and so on. So those are challenges. So actually, uh, because the quantum computer is built on solving short equations, essentially linear. The quantum mechanics is basically linear. Right? So people try. Well, here is a physical review letter paper by Sir Lloyd. This Lloyd, remember this HHL, the first quantum linear algebra solver. HHL is the, this L. Okay, Lloyd, very famous guy in quantum algorithm. So he wrote this letter, a paper in physical letter in 1998, where he tried to develop so nonlinear non quantum mechanics. Okay. He wants to solve Broca's equation for example. So that's the conclusion. He said, we would like to note that we believe that quantum mechanics is in all likelihood exactly linear. And above conclusion, the conclusion of this paper might be viewed most profitably as further evidence that this is indeed the case. Unfortunately, I mean, quantum mechanics is indeed linear, right? And nonlinear problem is almost impossible to solve. So that's his conclusion. Well, then, of course, then you have, there are only two possibilities to solve nonlinear problem. The first one, of course, you forget about what the Feynman thought about the quantum computer. You find a new way to design new type of computer, right? Not using quantum mechanics. I don't know, nobody knows how to do it. Then another route is that, okay, make the problem linear. Okay, you can make a nonlinear problem linear. But of course, mathematicians know how to make a problem linear, you just linearize it. Right? 
assume solution is small around the constant, uh, you know, do perturbation around the globe equation and so on. So that's what people do before us, actually. They are people, the most uh, popular one is so-called the Kalman truncation. So Kalman truncation uh, is very much like moment closure in kinetic theory. So you have a, you know, you have a knowledge equation, for example, a Riccardi equation, right? du dx equals minus u square. You call u square to be v. You write the equation for v. They have another nonlinearity called that w, writing over w. But if you can write infinity equation, they become the linear, but you have to stop sometimes. And anyway, stop, you always have the nonlinear term. You cannot get rid of it, just throw it away. Okay. That's called column and truncation. So that's what people have been doing before us. But you know, I mean, if you throw away nonlinear terms, and this model, validity model becomes questionable you know, after a long time. You lose a lot of physics. So what we we advocate is that can you find the exact mapping? Okay. So you find an equivalent formulation, but it becomes linear, nonlinear form becomes linear. But gen but nonlinear PD, that's what we try to do. But of course, this is very ambitious, okay? Most problem you, you don't know how to do it. But there are two classes of problems where we can do it. Okay. Why is the Hyman Jacobi equation? The other one is hyperbolic conservation law. But only scalar equation, not for nonlinear system. Okay. So this Hyman Jacobi equation, this is a conservation law. Well, if whether it's conserved or uh, non conservation doesn't matter. Non you can allow a nonlinear source. So for this type of type of we are able to do it. Well, there are applications I will skip. So how can we do it? And actually, I just uh, remind me of all the work I did with Stan Osher 20 years ago. Okay. When we try to solve a quasi linear PD, I mean, both Ham Jacobi and scalar conservation are quasi linear PDs. We want to solve it using level set method. So this is how we solve it. We define the phi. The original solution depends on t and x. It's now phi depends on t, x, and p. But p has the same, if he's a vector of the same dimension as x. So we define when the zero level set, if phi equals zero, then p equals u. So basically, the zero level set of phi give you the solution of the uh, quasi linear PD. Right, so here's a picture here. So this uh, cone is phi, and if plot is zero, the red curve is your u. It's the definition of phi, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, now for Ham Jacobi equation, as this sort of Ham Jacobi equation, the gradient u, and that's your u. That is just a matter of calculus, you can show that phi actually solves this equation. And that's actually nothing but linear Liu equation, okay? It's a linear Liu equation. So the solution of Jacobi, if you use the level set, you get a linear Liu equation. I mean, it's linear PDE. We, by far, no, we know, by, by, by now we know how to solve linear. All right. And this idea also works for scalar conservation law, scalar ba balance law. You can allow to source them, which means it also works for ODE because of you. conservation law, if the flux is zero, you get an ODE. But I have to point out for, for this equation, it has singularities. And after singularity, you have to use weak solutions. Usually, people use weak scalar solutions. But this kind of formulation actually does not give you this color solution. It gives so-called a multivariate solution. Well, Lauren worked a lot quite a bit on this multivariate solution. And this actually generates so-called multivariate solution. It does not get a viscous solution, all right? So multivariate solution, I, oh, uh, I can see on my screen here, but so let me give an example because people are here, uh, what kind of solution? So for example, if you have a problem equation, you have some sort of initial data, then after some time, you get this shock, right? A monovalu solution uh, actually is, 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 is this, uh, you get a triple value solution, for example. For a shock is that you, 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 you cut this by equal area rule, that's the shock. But the mon monovalu solution, you just get this, okay? Uh, for Hamid Jacobi also, uh, Hamid Jacobi actually also is applied to level set, level set method for from propagation. So you have two from, which moves uh, with unit, unit speed and Sometimes these two front will merge. Mm -hmm. And if it's a viscous solution, actually, you, you, you get this. You can get just a viscous solution. But the monovalu solution actually allow the overlap. So you have this overlap region. 
but the density is super close. So you say, why you care, why I care about mono resolution? I mean, everybody knows with got solution. Actually, here I list a few examples where only mono solutions make physical sense. Right. For example, in geometric optics, uh, seismic waves where you care not just the force of arrival, you care multiple arrivals. Mm -hmm. So this work by Osha session on this. And actually, anytime you take any symmetrical limit or hybrid limit of wave, you can always get multiple solutions. Because the monitor solution is satisfied linear superposition principle, where the shock or entropy wave does not satisfy it. Okay. So it's a, it comes from any Hamiltonian system to get this. So it's a, there are a lot of problems where monitor solution makes physical sense. But of course, we, we'll be usually also <laughs> be able to compute a discussion. We do know, not know how. It's open question. Okay. For you. Maybe you guys have an idea. I, I don't. So here, I just you want to compare with, uh, you want to show you have quantum advantage. So you compare the complexity. Now we have this quantum algorithm based on this formulation. You compare with the classical algorithm. Uh, so <coughs> complexity, the complexity C is the classical, complexity of classical, you say finite difference, finite volume. Q is the, our quantum algorithm. And then you have D is the space dimension to the power R, R1. Uh, so you want R1 to be positive. Then get exponential speed up. Okay. And the epsilon is the air accuracy requirement. So it's one of epsilon to the power r2. If you want a bit classical, you want r2 to be positive, and so on. So uh, for Hamilton Jacobi and the uh, hyperbolic equations, as you can see, d is and sufficiently large for high dimension. So it, 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 because the power r1 is positive, you get the exponential speed up on dimension. Okay, so you overcome the cost of dimensionality. If R2 is bigger, if D is bigger than 9, R2 is positive. You get an exponential speed on the accuracy, which means before you, you need M points to reach certain accuracy. Now you just need log M. So we get quantum energy for Ham-Jacobian scalar conservation, but for other equations, these are all always negative, which means if it works, you can put it on quantum computer, but you do not have quantum advantage. I mean, it's even worse. It's the ODE, for example, if you get all this in the left. For PD, well, this does not, this uh, level set does not, work for gen, work, does not work for general PD, but it can discretize spatial variable to make it OD, right? Any PD discretize. Then you, with OD, you can use the level set, but already for OD, I mean, you always get left numbers, so there's no quantum advantage. So how do you do a general nonlinear PD? We have no idea. This, this is why it's open. So here are some questions, open questions. General nonlinear PD, how to get a viscous solution of a high diamond, high dimensional dynamic system. So how to, how to design method. Also, uh, but the way I also interesting, can you realize this in the experiment? Okay. So that's a, that's what we have for nonlinear PD. So as you can see, it's largely open. We need a, a lot of new ideas. So last, uh, uh, the third question, so how about time-dependent coefficient? So very often they call a, a non-autonomous system. So for example, even for short <laughs> equation, the Hamiltonian time. time. Actually, it's very difficult for quantum computer because when when the Hamiltonian depends on time, uh, at different times, this operator does not commute. Okay. And analytic solution, you have to use this uh, Dyson series. <laughs> Because you have to order the time in the right way, okay? So of course, solution is e to the minus i h t integrate from zero to t at the top. That's an evolution operator. You need to put this time operator. You have to the time has to evolve from smaller time to large time in the right order. Otherwise, the solution is not right. Mm -hmm. So to interpret this, you have to cut the time into small intervals, and then you have to do this child splitting. Okay, it's a simple splitting, you split the operator, then you have to take the limit n to infinity. So you essentially have this infinity series called Dyson series. Okay. And then you have to truncate because the numeric can go not to infinity, you have to truncate. So it's a very concrete. I mean, the latest state of art. Uh, so all the previous algorithms depend on this Dyson series. This is the latest examples by Lin Lin at Berkeley. So you can see that you evolve one time step, you have to measurement. 
then you take another time, uh, you want uh, another measurement. And the measurement is very concrete. So it's very, very difficult to do time dependent problem. I mean, event coefficient depend on time. So our strategy is that, uh, again, we, we go to one dimension higher to make a non, a non autonomous and autonomous. So what we do is that uh, you can use it for. Now we have, uh, we solve a W, which depends on not only time, but the actual variable T. The T is sort of a pseudo time variable, all right? So then actually you have a linear transport equation, uh, and also now this Hamiltonian does not depend on T, it depends on S. S is the pseudo time variable. So we have this linear transport equation, okay? And now if you solve this, uh, solve this equation, then you basically integrate, uh, integrate S out, you get U. So here you can put this a delta function, a Gaussian or some uh, even one. Then you just recover original Y by just integrate this S. So the idea is again, go to one dimension higher. So if it's OD, it becomes PD, okay? It becomes PD. Uh, but it's PD with a linear convection. And it's sort of a pseudo time variable. Right. Well, of course, adding variable is not new. Okay. Previously, in mathematical community, if you have a non, I mean, a non, non autonomous ODE, so if, if you have an H depends on T, you call T to be tau, then you get a new equation T tau D equals one. Then that becomes non, non, it becomes autonomous. That's what people do before, right? I and mean, if you, but the problem with this is that if your original equation, if it's linear, okay, before it's HT acting on you is linear, if you do this, it becomes nonlinear. Okay? This is nonlinear OD. If you start with linear OD, this this idea, this this classic idea, you must not make a nonlinear and a quantum computer does not cannot solve nonlinear. While our our formulation it's still linear because s is the independent variable while the other one s becomes dependent variable that makes it nonlinear. okay for our case if you go to one dimension higher s is the independent variable i mean s is like a space variable then linear equation remain linear that's what quantum computer likes all right so well of course this is a harmonious system for any general pd you can first shortenerize it Okay, that becomes a non autonomous shortener. You can then use, use this uh, go to one dimension higher, make, make it non autonomous. Another feature is that this is time and space are continuous. We do not have to use Dyson series, we do not have a discrete time, so which makes this uh, continuous variable possible. You do not have to rely on qubits or qubits. You can still use qubits if you discrete time, but you don't have to use qubits. So you allow this. Uh, Q modes formulation. Uh, well, there's another one. I'll probably skip the last part. Uh, so I just uh, so the conclusion. So what we have done? I mean, we just you have to remember that quantum computers designed using uh, basically designed to just to solve short equation, right? But for any linear PDODE, even with boundary conditions or interface conditions, we find this uh, simple. Transformation to one dimension higher, so it becomes a Schrodinger equation. And it works for any linear dynamic system, PDOD, or even a discrete uh, dynamic system, like, like an iter iterative linear algebra solver, can all be formulated into a Schrodinger equation. Okay, so, therefore, now quantum computer will be able to solve all the other differential equations. For nonlinear problem, uh, what we can do is rather limited. Okay, only two kinds of problems nonlinear Ham Jacobi. Equation and the scalar conservation law. You know, we use this level set, we double the dimension. Okay, you double the dimension, become linear. And then now, now autonomous PD, we, we, we just also go to one dimension higher to make it autonomous. So, this is my uh, some, some philosophic thinking okay, about this uh, business. Well, actually, in the last 100 years, uh, the mathematician and physicist, people like uh, Mario, work very hard to bring the dimension down. You start with very high dimensional problem, for example, unbody shortening equation. You use all machinery, right, for dimension reductions, cost graining, mean field limit, 
moment closure to bring dimension down. The reason is classical computer has this curse of dimensionality, cannot solve high dimension problem. You have to bring the dimension down. And in the past centuries, all mathematicians work very hard. There's a lot of important theory to, to do that. Okay. The price you pay, of course, once you go to low dimension, it becomes non-linear. If you have some molecular chaos, well, there's a word leader here. If you do molecular chaos, make it things linear become non-linear. Well, what we have been doing, at least my our approach, is go the opposite because quantum computer is not afraid of dimension as long as it's not too high. Okay, so we actually we go opposite direction. We live to higher, but not too high. Okay, I mean, it's not going to embody Schrodinger. That's too high. We add is a one dimension to Schrodinger is or double the dimension. Okay, so the idea is can you lift to too high? Go go to higher dimension to so the problem quantum can we can solve them, all right? So for nonlinear PD, we go to well, double dimension become linear PD. Then we add another dimension to become Schrodinger equation. Okay. For non-autonomous system again, going to high dimension become autonomous. And actually, for random PD, we also find go high dimension become deterministic. This random coefficient actually goes to the initial data if you go to high dimension. Mm -hmm. So so we have so this is our general approach is go to high dimension is opposite. So finally, take home message. If you get trouble in low dimension, the best idea is to go to high dimension to solve your problem. So thank you. OK. No questions, comments? Uh, yeah, excuse me. Maybe I missed a uh, part uh, of your talk at the beginning. You mentioned that the HHL algorithm Provide uh, an exponential speed up. Yes. But it, it is under some condition, not in general. I think that in general, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, you uh, can provide an exponential speed up if you have uh, so a uh, low condition number. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Of course. number of, of, uh, of uh, condition. Yeah, because complexity depends on condition number and also sparsity. So if it's full matrix, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's bad. But for PD, you usually, if you find different kind of volume, you have a sparse matrix. Yeah, you have a sparse matrix, but even I think band in that, that probably. Uh, that the condition number is bad. I mean, uh, usually, yeah, the condition number, for example, elliptic operator, condition number is like yeah. one of each square, right? But for, for solving the PD, you, you need the full vector. Yes. And uh, I think that you can get the exponential speed up only if you get just the say the size of the scalar uh, well you don't get quantum event in low dimension because you have this for example elliptic operator condition number is one over h square ah. but for very high dimension you still win for two or three you don't win <laughs> for yeah. high dimension i mean quantum gun is designed for very high dimension okay so all these sparse and high dimension you still win Other questions or your remarks? Curiosity. But for instance, in finance and Black and Schultz in a high, very high dimension, have you tried to apply this kind of means? Yeah, well, I remember I, I mentioned the Black Show, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are people working on black shore because the most uh, the area that's most interesting in quantum computing is finance and drug design. They said that's where <laughs> you really need quantum computing. Yeah, so okay, so I did mention the first example of linear black shore equations. Linear ones, right? Nonlinear we don't know. Right? Yeah, nonlinear PD is a major open area. And when you need new idea, how do you go high dimension? Make it linear. Actually, well, last year I gave a talk in Sobam and the uh, young Brenier. He said that 50 years ago, Laura Schwartz actually had this conjecture. He said that all the nonlinear problems in low dimension become linear in high dimension. The question is how? How do we go high dimension? Of course, in the last uh, 100 years, uh, nobody cares. Everybody's working from reduced dimension, right? Nobody has thought about how to go the opposite direction. But if you care about quantum computing, you should 
think of the opposite way I and mean, how to go high dimension to make it make it easier for quantum computer. So you need new mathematical thinking. Or well, the mass I mean, has not been thought about this direction. It's always one reduced direction. So how can it excuse? For yeah, the, uh, of course I thought about that. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, the first idea I thought about the is use Cartan Telmo formulation called the kinetic. But the problem is that uh, you know this better. I mean, uh, Yang Priya has this transport collapsing. Transport is okay because of linear collapsing is bad. You have to project to local Max Wheeler. You know this, of course. And the relaxation is the same idea. <laughs> yeah, this projection to local equilibrium is bad because that's a nonlinear map. Yeah, so the question, my conjecture, you probably need to go to even higher. Go to phase space to the double dimension, probably not enough. You need more dimensions. But I don't know how. I mean, you probably. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, BGK, or I mean, this discrete kinetic formulation or relaxation is not enough. You need more, I yeah. think. Yeah. So you are semi linear? And yeah, post linear, enough. where the relaxation of kinetic post becomes semi linear. Now, how to go semi linear to be completely linear? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of interesting mathematics. But in the approach to multiple new solution is, is exactly to remove part of the collapse operator. Oh, well, exactly. In, in the extreme case, you, you yeah, cut, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, Young yeah. wrote a paper, if it collapse, it becomes uh, entropy solution. Of course, it cannot collapse. Yeah. Or you collapse a little bit less to allow branches to develop. Yeah, but you have too many branches. It's difficult. You don't know how, where, I mean, <laughs> where to stop. That's the point. Yeah, I think we need more dimensions, but I don't know how. Okay, so there are more other questions. Thank you again. Okay.